Welcome back to the Closure Cones walkthrough number 13, looking at recursion. So what is recursion? Well, recurs a recursive function is a function that calls itself. Uh, here's an example at the top where we take a look at this is even function inside of its definition is a call to itself. We'll see more examples of this later. Uh, this is probably not the only way to represent the is even function. Uh, it's probably not the best way at all, but for demonstrating some recursion, we can take a look at it. So let's jump right in here. It looks like we're gonna have to fill in a couple of blanks here with uh, the function to make it actually work, but they're gonna guide us through that a little bit here. So recursion ends with a base case, a base case. So re that's a key thing here. Recursion has to end. If the function just keeps on calling itself forever, that's no good. <laughs> uh, it needs to eventually return some result. And that's what we do in the base case. So here, a base the base case for this function, I guess, is uh, when n is zero. When you pass a zero, it looks like that's simply going to return true. And sure enough, up here, we've got this if condition as the very first statement, and we're going to test if n is zero. And if so, I guess we're going to return immediately with the value true. So that takes care of the base case, but our function isn't quite working yet. We still have to fill in this blank part. Um, so what's our next hint? Uh, recursion starts by moving toward the base case, that base case. Okay, so that's the key point of recursion is that you can't just call the function again with the exact same arguments because you wouldn't be making any progress. That would be an endless loop. So in the test case they gave us, they're passing one for n. And when we make the recursive call here, we're going to call is even with the value zero. So that's actually our base case, and we already know that's going to be returning true. Well, if is even is called with zero, we need to uh, flip the result. It was going to return true, but that's not what we want to return for n equals one. So we're going to use this not operation or this not function to flip the result. Whatever is even returns for n minus one, we want to flip it for n. That seemed to make the these two examples pass. So we we passed in an odd number, and sure enough, it returned false. Now let's demonstrate some of the problems with implementing it in this way. So you'll see that. If we pass 10, for instance, to the isEven function, it's going to have to call itself like 10 times doing all that recursion. Basically, whatever the size of n is, that's how many recursive calls it needs to make. And these are not free. Every time it makes a nested call to, the, to itself, it's adding a function call onto the stack. And the stack is limited. And here, let's pass a, a larger number, 100. It's working. Um, Let's keep on passing an odd number, how about? <laughs> okay, so 1,001, that's still working. 10,001, uh-oh, stack overflow error. You see that on the bottom? So we've reached the limit of our stack. This function is not, the way we've implemented it, is not able to handle very large numbers of n. So let's look at the next, next example. They're going to guide us through a more efficient way to implement this. So this one is called is even big int. So it deals with big integers. Closure has a concept of integers like one, two, three, four, but it also has a concept of a, a big int. Uh, we can check the type of any kind of variable by using the type function. And the type, let me fix the stack overflow error first. Um, the type of one, two, three, four is a long. Okay, now what about if we use this syntax, one, two, three, four, n, to indicate this is a big int. I want this to be a big int. So now it says it's a big int. Now what's the difference? Well, a big int uh, can store like an arbitrarily large integer. 
So it can be useful when you're doing some big calculations and you want to hang on to large values that wouldn't fit into 64 bits. So here's an implementation that can apparently handle a very large value of n. And let's see how they're doing it. We know that if you have too many recursive calls on the stack, it's going to have a stack overflow and the program is going to die. So what Clojure has is a way to do uh, tail make some tail recursive calls without using up any space on the stack. And the way it works is with this loop uh, expression and this recur, this call to recur. So recur lets us make a recursive call, but it's always it must be made in the tail position, meaning you must be returning whatever it returns immediately without doing any additional operations on it. And that's not the case that we saw up here. Here we're making a recursive call, but it's not in the tail position. It's uh, we make the recursive call and then once it returns, we have to do some more work on it. Yeah, so it consumes stack space. But here, if we're, if we're making tail recursive calls and we're using the recur keyword, it can turn this into iteration. So instead of making function calls, function calls, function calls, it can instead translate this directly into some iteration. So it's kind of just doing some looping here without consuming any stack space. So let's take a look at how this implement, implementation works. Uh, let's see, having too many stack frames requires explicit tail calls with recur. So again, uh, we're going to take a look at a function that's just needs to return true if this number is even. But the, our very first statement is this loop keyword, and we're initializing two variables. So we're saying we're going to have an n, and we're going to initialize it as the n value that we were given here that came into the function but we're also going to initialize this accumulator and we're going to initialize it to true so what happens is instead of making these recursive calls that are going to that are going to queue up and then finally return what we're going to be doing is instead be keeping track of all the all the values along the way inside of this accumulator Okay, so let's see how this works. Our very first statement is checking for our base case. If n equals zero, then we return. Well, what do we return? Up above, we, re we return true, but that's not what we want to do here. That might work in one case, but <laughs> that's not how we want to do it here. Instead, what we want to do is we want to end the recursion. So when we end the recursion, we want to return the value of the accumulator. So we'll return that. Um, and we'll see why that makes sense here. Um, when we, if it's not the base case, then we need to do recursion. So when we call recur, it's basically like calling loop again. And we need to provide a value for n and a value for the accumulator. So for n, we pass the value n minus 1, dec n, just like we saw above. And here we do our work immediately, one small step of work. We're gonna, we need to pass a value for the new accumulator, and what's that gonna be? Well, it's gonna be the opposite of what our accumulator currently is. So we're gonna do that not operation right here and pass it along. And so that, that works. Now you see why at the very end, when, you, when all of the work is done and we've reached our base case, it's time to just return that accumulator value. So, it looks like we made that test case pass and it worked with a larger value of n, much larger than we saw up above, worked with 100,000. Um, let's go on to another example though of looking at a recursive function. So recursive reverse. Here we need to write a function that's going to reverse this collection or it's going to return this same collection but in reverse all the items have been reversed so looks like we're gonna have to, have to write the full implementation of it um, and they've given us a couple of examples reversing directions is easy when you've not gone far they only have one element in the collection so that simply returns back the a collection with just that same element but here's a more complicated example where it's calling the our reverse function with five 
uh, elements in the list and then it needs to return back those same five elements in reverse order so that's our challenge um, let's do it using our new looping construct that we saw this loop and recur so how would we do this we need to start out with how about we start out with the collection and we'll initialize it to collection and we also instead of just accumulator why don't we call it reversed and we'll initialize it to an empty list so just these uh, parentheses empty parentheses represents an empty list so oops i think this is messed up yeah i need that let's get the right indentation so we've got loop where we're passing it a collection and we're building up the reversed uh, version of that so what do we do what's our base case why don't we check for that first how about if the collection is empty then it's time to return the reversed we've we've finished there's nothing left to reverse um, now here's where we do some recursion so if we didn't reach our base case then we have to call recur and recur expects a value for collection and for reversed so how are we going to reverse this list like step by step well one thing we can do is take one element off of that list so we remove the first element from the list and what does that leave the rest of the collection so we've whittled down the collection by one element and what are we going to do with that one element well let's put that on to reversed the reversed uh, collection that we're building up so we will cons the first element of the collection onto reversed so reversed starts out being empty and we just pop off the first element from the collection and put it onto this empty list and go from there we just keep on we just keep on building up the list in that way cool so you know that's kind of weird looking at the the functions in this way like doing recursion but once you get a little bit used to it you'll become more comfortable with this concept and it'll be more natural sounding to you so okay let's look at the next implementation we need to do so here's a, a good example it's a factorial function now I commented out the last couple of cases because they deal with really big numbers and they might bog down uh, my processing so I'll uncomment them at the, at the end uh, at, but for now let's just look at implementing this function so what is the factorial um, actually let's take a look at Wikipedia Wikipedia has a nice definition for factorial and in fact it can be recursively defined so factorial is this exclamation mark like n exclamation mark is the factorial of n and here's the recursive definition factorial of n is 1 if n equals 0 or it's n minus 1 factorial times n if n is greater than 0 so this is like our base case if n equals 0 we simply return 1 otherwise we have a recursive definition where we where we take the n and then we multiply it by a reduced form here where we say n minus 1 factorial so there you go that's uh, what we need to be implementing in our function so let's try to do that um, again we're going to use the same loop concept loop and recur and we need to initialize some variables first let's again deal with the n and then we'll deal with the accumulator and the accumulator will be calculating the the factorial 
And since we're dealing with multiplication, where we're saying n times the factorial n minus one, uh, et cetera, our, our unit of work is like the multiplication. So let's use a one here. Let's initialize our accumulator as one because anything times one, it doesn't change the, the, the value. So since we defined our loop here, and now let's let's test for our base case. What is our base case here? Well, it was defined on Wikipedia, we saw. The base case was when n equals zero, then what happens? We return one, right? But, oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> here we would return the accumulator, of course. So when our work is done, we return the accumulator. And in the other case here, we would do recursion. So we use our fancy recur keyword, and we're going to need to supply values for n and for the accumulator. So for n, we'll pass n minus 1. And for the accumulator, what do we need to do for the accumulator? We need to return back uh, a multiplication of n and the accumulator, whatever we've accumulated so far. Whatever, we just need to multiply n times that. So, it looks like that did the trick. We are now able to pass these few uh, test cases. But now we get down to the bottom and it's talking about dealing with very large numbers. So the factorial, it's going to be using iteration rather than like nested calls. So we don't have to worry about a stack overflow, but it is, however, doing a lot of iteration uh, based on the size of the number. And the, the number that it's multiplying out, the result is growing very quickly. So let's just uncomment this and see what we get. Okay, this one is passing. It was able to calculate the factorial of 1,000, which is a pretty big number. In fact, let's take a quick look at what that number is. Factorial of 1,000. Yeah, that is a huge number. Okay, I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Goodness. Okay, but it calculated it pretty quickly. That's nice. And finally, they've got one more case here where it's a really big number and they're saying what happens when the machine limits you or when the machine limits you let's see okay this kind of took over my CPU here it's just kind of calculating calculating let me wait for it to finish hey finally returned well in this case it worked for us we didn't have any issues with this calculating result Cool. Well, I hope this one was interesting and maybe got you thinking a little bit. So with that, I'll see you in the next video.